So um, I, I would like now to uh, welcome our next uh, speaker, um, uh, Professor uh, Nick uh, Oguke uh, from, again, the University of Nairobi. Uh, he's had uh, such a busy day. Uh, this is uh, his first break since uh, he started working at eight this morning. So uh, we are extremely privileged that uh, he uh, could take time uh, to join us uh, uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, professor Oguke uh, is a professor of uh, environmental policy uh, at the University of Nairobi and uh, serves as director for the Center for Advanced Studies in Environmental Law and Policy, or KESLAP, uh, at, at Nairobi. Uh, he has a very wide uh, uh, breadth of experience um, uh, in environmental uh, policy um, and analysis, uh, ranging from renewable energy to plastics to urban planning, uh, to management of uh, ecosystems, management of indigenous knowledge. Uh, uh, he has uh, looked at the food, energy, water nexus, uh, and has looked at issues around biodiversity. We have worked on so many issues uh, together, sanitation, uh, on, on plastics, uh, on general uh, uh, international uh, environmental policy. Uh, he speaks science, uh, he speaks law, he speaks policy, and uh, we couldn't have a better uh, climate uh, advocate, a better uh, environmental policy uh, advocate uh, to wrap up our discussions this afternoon. Uh, uh, Nick, uh, welcome. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you with us, and I yield the floor to you. Thank you, Toko. Thank you. And uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, because of uh, internet problems, I may actually not uh, perform with my video on. And uh, uh, good afternoon, um, everybody who is in participating here today. So I have a few slides that will guide my, uh, my, my talk. Uh, is it okay to share them, Toko? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Are you able to see them? Yes, you're on. Thank you. Great. Um, just um, one more problem. They, I'm getting some pop-ups which started um, this morning. I don't know whether it is uh, somebody trying to get into my system. So if there's a pop-up coming through, uh, we'll try to ignore it. And I hope it's not going to uh, completely affect uh, this presentation. Okay, so um, I was asked to, to talk about the key issues in climate justice in the global south. And uh, Toko has given a, a very comprehensive maybe a more comprehensive uh, introduction of myself. I just want to point out that uh, I did finish my term as director for KESLAB, and so somebody else is uh, running that, that's Dr. Colin Sadote. So um, thank you for the uh, detailed intro nonetheless. Okay, so in uh, discussing the key issues in climate justice and global south, um, I think there are a few things that we need to be on the same page on. And it's quite possible that these are issues you've already covered since morning uh, because you've had a very rich discussion since morning. But nonetheless, uh, the first problem or the first issue we need to get to together on is what is climate justice? And there could be different ways people look at this. But for the purposes of uh, this afternoon's talk, perhaps we will um, you know, relate to what Neville et al. Um, indicated in 2020. So they said that this may be construed to reflect 
the facts that causes and effects of climate change and efforts to address it raise ethical, equity, and right issues. However, we can also look at the issue of climate justice more broadly, and in other words, justice for whom, for what, and how. So climate justice may be viewed broadly in terms of the fairness, equity, and rightness of response to climate change. So we have climate change already uh, happening and the impacts are being viewed there. So we could already apply the responses to how the, the, the impact of climate change is to see the level of fairness, equity, and rightness that uh, is being applied, whether it's a global level or perhaps even at uh, national or sub-national levels. But I joined the talk uh, when uh, Professor Kamari Mbote was, uh, was on the podium and one of the issues she came up, she raised actually, is that, uh, you know, when these discussions commenced uh, many years back, one of the issues was that those who have done least to cause climate change are the ones suffering most from its effects. And maybe this was an issue uh, that perhaps those people didn't realize initially when they were saying, uh, we are not contributing to this, why should we be involved in this discussion? But with time, they realize that they're actually suffering most and therefore should be part and parcel of this discussion. So what are the key issues then? The key issues is that uh, we need, apart from understanding what climate justice is, we need to know what constitutes the global South. What is the language of climate justice in terms of its definition, and how it's understood at different scales. What are the mechanisms for delivering it? And how do you measure it? What are the mechanisms for its delivery? So there are many questions that uh, we need to deal with when addressing this issue of climate justice, but also the issue of global south. So we'll start Again, by or we'll continue by trying to understand what we mean by the global south. It is generally understood to refer to less economically developed countries. Generally, it's a broad term and comprises a variety of states with diverse levels of economic, cultural, and political influence in the international order. The World Bank defines it as countries located in Asia, in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. But what is common characteristic among these countries is that they often have lower incomes compared to countries in the so-called global north. Many of these countries are hit hardest by climate change. And many of them also have had little responsibility to the current climate crisis. So we have a dilemma here. We have countries that are generally poor, that have contributed least to climate problem, but are most are hardest hit by the climate crisis. That constitutes the global south. So in discussing climate justice in the global south this afternoon, my approach here will involve the following. One is to look at it as an issue of procedural climate justice. Second, as an issue of distributive climate justice. And finally, as intergenerational climate justice. So this will form the rest of uh, the short discussion I'm going to have with you uh, this afternoon. So let's start with the issue of procedural climate justice. So this is an aspect of climate justice that is fundamentally about processes for making decisions about impacts of and 
responses to climate change that are fair, accountable, and transparent. Okay. In the context of climate negotiations, there have been long standing critics of process inequalities. And this could revolve around, say, the unequal size of delegations and sharp inequities in access to scientific and legal expertise. So you find that uh, perhaps when people are going for negotiations, some countries may just have a handful of uh, delegates, maybe five, while other countries will have up to party, maybe more. And within those countries, within the large delegation, they have scientific experts, they have legal experts, social experts, and so on. And the team that are going small are perhaps just the senior government officials with very little knowledge about the scientific and legal issues around climate change. So that in itself makes the negotiation skewed against such uh, people or such countries from the global south. But let's give an example here. Let's take COP25. You find that uh, in COP25, there was a large Gulf state delegates. 40 of them were already working for fossil fuel companies or were former employees of fossil fuel companies. So all, these are people that have got vested interest and are going there to negotiate, perhaps to, uh, in support of uh, fossil fuel companies in the first place. Then it also happened that uh, during this uh, COP25, some vulnerable and developing countries were excluded from backroom discussions on the issue of carbon market rules. That is injustice. Also, we find that uh, the politics around this uh, discussion sometimes um, border on brinkmanship, which entrenches uh, these inequalities in representation. Now, to capture what happened in Madrid in the COP25 was best done by uh, Salemu Haq. Now, he said that COP25 was the longest COP ever, having gone on for two extra days and nights beyond the originally planned 12 days. This tendency, now standard practice at COPs, to take negotiations into overtime for a day or more is not only extremely inefficient, but is also deeply unfair to the most vulnerable developing countries whose delegates cannot stay on. Thus, the decisions made in the last hours of extra time are invariably detrimental to their interests and by the time they get home and see the final text, they see their words have disappeared. So these are some of the uh, procedural issues that brings about inequality and a lot of injustices as we have discussions around climate change in the past. So what are the other critical challenges? Well, the Southern-led research and policy work has a scope on how to change the processes of decision-making at the COPs that might enhance Southern voice and representation, particularly of least developed countries and more marginalized, marginal, marginalized groups. So, we have a scope here uh, as the global south. We need to 
to show, to come up with an approach that will show equity, will exhibit equity in these discussions. And there are institutes that are capable of perhaps taking on some of these um, challenges to see whether they can uh, you know, pro pro uh, progress the African agenda or the Global South agenda. Now this will ensure that future negotiations give adequate and proper voice to those in the front line of climate change without further privileging the polluter elites. Otherwise, the entire COP architecture may risk further jeopardy. Now, to finalize on the procedural aspect of uh, climate justice, there are about um, six points that perhaps we need to, uh, to discuss around. The first one is participation in international policy processes. You know, one of the core concerns, particularly for the global south, has been the ability to participate equally in international negotiation processes. And that is some of the examples I've given uh, just before this summary. And major challenges remain in this area and needs to be addressed uh, moving forward. So participation is a problem because it is costly, it's expensive, and therefore uh, for many global South, they're not able to take a team that is fully conversant with all aspects required and therefore negotiate at the same level as the polluters. The second aspect is participation of different social groups at national level. Now, we talk a lot about this problem at global level, but little focus has been given to climate justice within countries. Beyond the global level, what is happening at the national and subnational level? What are the decision-making processes and how are the vulnerable groups being um, addressed under these circumstances? So this is one issue that also must be addressed even by the countries in the global south. The third one is ability to make claims for resource access. A necessary focus of climate justice processes is the proactive agency of many marginalized groups in asserting and defending their rights and making their, voice, their voices heard. This concerns climate-related interventions, but perhaps equally important are policies and decisions that underpin adaptive capacity, such as land and water rights. The fourth one is recognition and integration of plural knowledge. This is a key justice concern. Over recent years, there have been a growing attention to local knowledge and its importance in understanding challenges as well as divisive solutions. However, as yet, there's limited progress on actual integration of knowledge other than scientific or formal knowledge in decision-making processes. So we, we have the indigenous knowledge uh, or the indigenous uh, communities maybe participating in some of this, but is their knowledge ever taken into consideration? Is their knowledge incorporated in decision-making? I don't think so. Very little of that happens. Then we have the legal empowerment and use of rights. This concerns the legal recognition of rights of vulnerable groups and their ability to realize those rights. This will be key to climate justice strategy. As an example, we find that integrating women in climate related intervention is necessary, but not sufficient in strategies to improve climate justice. 
This is because if the underlying conditions mean that women are disadvantaged, such efforts could reinforce or worsen their conditions by adding rather than reducing their burdens. So this underscores the need for more transformative approaches to climate justice. Under these processes, perhaps the last point will be accountability in government and then government, private sector, climate action. Now this concerns to what extent processes that are meant to, uh, to serve poor and marginalized populations are transparent in their goals as well as processes and relates to emissions of the GSG gas or GS gases, as well as their effects on vulnerability to climate related risks. So those have been pulled out as uh, some of the uh, problems around the different processes. So then that brings me to the next area of distributed justice. That is about how social goods and social bias are allocated spatially and temporally across society. How are people benefiting? How are people being impacted at spatial level and with time? Questions of who gets to use what resources in a carbon constrained world raise issues of climate justice in the form of responsibility. That is the current versus historical and entitlement. Whose needs are the most pressing and who decides who can emit how much? Of course, now we know that we have the nationally determined um, setups that, that uh, different countries are having. So the key aspect of distribution are three. Identifying the goods and the ills that are being distributed. Whether it is water, whether it is wealth, etc. Second is identifying the entities between which they are to be distributed. Whether they are members of between generations. Identifying the most appropriate mode of distribution as well as what this is based on. Is it status? Is it need? Is it merit? Is it right? Is it social identity? How do we distribute? the issues most appropriately. And therefore, debate on carbon debt owed by richer countries to poorer ones has been in trend uh, for some time. Then there's the issue of loss and damage. Although mitigation and adaptation are meant to address issues of loss and damage, they're likely to occur in future. In several cases, the damage has already occurred or remains inevitable in the face of extreme weather events. So while we are addressing the issue of mitigation and adaptation, we need to really understand that damage is here with us and we need to see how we can address those damage. Now, given that there's been suggestion that we need to set emission limits on equitable basis. So when we are looking at distributive justice, which is an outcome focus, 
we can also discuss it under six critical points. Just transitions, just energy access, outcomes from mitigation interventions, just distribution of benefits from adaptation and resilience programs, justice and conflicts over resource use, justice in efforts to achieve core benefits or triple wins such as climate smart agriculture or red plus. So let us look at the just transition. A key justice concern is the extent to which transition to low carbon economies are inclusive. Recognizing the different burdens, cost, and potential for benefits among different social groups. Now, let's just take an example of uh, using solar energy systems in rural um, Africa or poor, as an example. Now, if you do that, of course, you're transiting to low carbon um, aspect of the economy in that area. But because it is such an expensive system to set up, uh, you find that uh, it is not necessarily inclusive. Uh, countries and uh, maybe societies that are better endowed are likely to set up a massive you know, solar system for purposes of transiting the economy, but not uh, the poor ones. So that is the problem of just transition. Just energy access. Now this is an important yet contested area relating to how benefits and costs on energy service, services are distributed. How are energy services distributed? What are the costs? What are the benefits of the same? So this is um, an area that uh, perhaps also need to, to always be um, discussed. Uh, example say for, uh, for Kenya, we find that uh, we have some areas of, of wind energy um, you know, generation, uh, but they're so far removed um, from center uh, where most of the energy is used. So then the cost of transporting uh, that energy to the cities um, and, and to the industries, you know, make the, the costs again for, for energy production, for, for, for energy costs very high. So this, this just energy access, that also uh, an issue that uh, need to be um, determined. Then the outcomes for mitigation interventions. Uh, from mitigation inter interventions, we say that um, while this is linked to issues of just transition that we've just discussed, there are added concerns around how mitigation interventions, which is typically seen as necessary and a global, a global public good may have an intended negative or positive consequences in terms of human rights, land use, uh, as well as other implications for livelihoods that may affect vulnerability to climate related shocks and, and stressors. Uh, an example here would be, uh, we may want say to have um, bioenergy as part of our low carbon economy. And this will require that we have space or we have land where, where we grow the crops that we can therefore get the uh, clean energy from. And this can easily end up with land grabs. So you find that uh, people who can do that investment are perhaps not local, so they come from elsewhere and they hire large um, you know, pieces of land for this purpose. And in the process, the local people are displaced. So that's why uh, we need to be careful around that. Then we have uh, the just distribution of benefits for adaptation and resilience programs. So unlike the mitigation projects, adaptation and resilience benefits are primarily local in nature, yet they may affect people differently. 
decisions over who is prioritized in adaptation finance has strong climate justice dimensions. And there's significant evidence to suggest that not everyone will benefit equally from adaptation intervention. And so the climate financing, uh, we know the, the difficulty of accessing those funds. And that is just part of this just distribution of benefits from adaptation and resilience programs. Then we have uh, justice and conflict over resource use. Now, there are well-known linkages between exploration, extraction, and distribution of energy, but also concerns that climate action may reinforce conflicts or introduce new forms of injustices. Then we have the justice in efforts to achieve core benefits or triple wins, such as climate, smart agriculture, or right class. Now these are goals and interventions that are promoted for their potential to generate triple wins in terms of mitigation, adaptation, and development. Yet, while this may be the case at higher scales, at a project or local scale, there may be significant differences in who benefits and who may lose. For instance, people may lose access to forest resources because they're in the red class, you're not allowed to perhaps go and collect something from the forest. And there may be significant trade-offs, example, between mitigation and food security. So um, when you're doing the climate smart agriculture, perhaps maybe what you're growing is high value crops that, that perhaps you're not necessarily eating and it's maybe for purposes of export. So these are some of the issues that uh, needs to be um, addressed and looked at. Finally, I want to talk about the intergenerational climate justice. How is this being addressed in the global south? Well, three basic principles of intergenerational equity posit that the legacy passed to the next generation should, pre uh, should preserve three components options, quality, access for next generation. When you talk about the options, we are looking at future generations and we ask whether they have the same range of options open to them as it is open to us, or as it was open to our fathers and grandfathers. And you can apply this to different resources. You can apply it to forests. And when you apply to forests, then you're looking at issues of carbon sequestration. Maybe we've reduced our forest cover substantially. And in the process, we have reduced our capacity or the, the ecosystem capacity for carbon sequestration. So what have you done therefore? You've reduced the the a range of options which is open to the future generation. And this in the global south uh, is a problem. We know uh, whether it is in the Amazon forest, uh, we know whether it is in the uh, tropical rainforest, and we know in our different um, you know, countries that the forest cover is one, one ecosystem type that we are losing at a very high rate. So what we are doing is we're reducing the option for the future generations by uh, destroying this particular kind of, of ecosystem type. The other one is quality. So what is the quality of environment that the future generation is going to inherit from us? So if we destroy the current environment, we increase the land degradation. It means that 
we are giving the future generation a road deal. We're giving them a road deal in terms of the quality of environment that we are going to give to them. And therefore, it becomes much more difficult for them to manage such an environment. And lastly, access for the next generation. Now, what is the equitable access to the legacy from past generation? What is it that we are passing to them that they can conserve and access in future? So those are three uh, components that are um, at the point of discussion around um, intergenerational climate justice. And um, so far, I think I'll, um, I've used up my 30 minutes and plus, and I want to stop my discussion now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Nick. That was a, a really detailed discussion of uh, the various strands of uh, justice uh, that emerge when uh, we talk about the international climate change regime. And I was uh, listening closely to some of the examples that you're giving, and you know uh, how uh, interested I am in matters that uh, relate to energy access. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the issue of balancing uh, uh, energy access that is necessary uh, for, uh, uh, for our, our people in, in Africa to ensure that uh, this opens up greater enjoyment of uh, certain socioeconomic rights, you know, the right to education, for example, the right to health, you know, uh, these rights that cannot be properly guaranteed without access to energy. At the same time, it is also uh, important uh, that uh, we have a good perspective about uh, future generations and uh, the impacts that uh, may uh, result from uh, climate change. And we know that a lot of energy systems uh, will have a deleterious uh, impact on, uh, on the climate. And so how do we balance? How do we balance uh, that? And so that was uh, really, really good. And um, I, I enjoyed that. I don't know. If any of our participants have got uh, have got have got questions, but uh, I would I would want uh, some uh, perspectives from you about this energy question. I mean, how uh, should uh, African states go about designing their energy policy in a way that results in uh, uh, sustainable energy for the future? Yeah. Um... Thank you, Toko. And I think maybe one of the, uh, the points you're making when you're introducing me, you indicated about uh, my interest in, in the doing things using the Nexus approach. And um, I, I think we can look at energy um, at, at different levels. There'll be the energy for industrialization, but also the energy for use by people. Um, people need energy for at a very low level for purposes of cooking um, you know their food and uh, maybe even heating their houses etc so for me um, when I think of energy and I want to start at uh, the local level uh, that household level um, and and I want to start it with a, a rural um, setup in Africa uh, these are people who largely use uh, maybe firewood, um, biomass energy in general. And um, what I'd like to say is that we need to link the energy access at, the, at that level uh, with water access and with food access so that we don't look at any of them in isolation, but we look at them in a very integrated manner. And um, my thinking normally is that um, we need to empower people to have self-sufficiency in those three. Now, we know that um, access to water sometimes tend to be limited to piped water system or, um, or ponds uh, or, or pans that are distributed sparsely across these large areas. 
So my thinking, and, and uh, this is one of the papers I was writing to, to try and um, advise the uh, East African community, for instance, is to use an excess approach of rainwater harvesting. We, we harvest adequate amount of, of rain when it's falling. We ensure that we use it to grow crops, but also to, to grow some woody uh, vegetation, which can then be perhaps used for purposes of, um, of making. Um, and of course, this will require a bit of technology also uh, for, for low um, you know, sort of um, emissions of, of, of gases at, at, at their place. But more importantly, if we can have that system plus you're having some livestock, we can go on the energy side of, of using uh, biogas by generating biogas and using biogas. So that system becomes self-sustaining within a home level. Uh, when you're generating biogas from the, off, uh, from the droppings of your livestock, uh, what happens is that you are re reducing that emission of methane to the environment and you're burning it for purposes of, of your cooking and your heating and ETC. Uh, but you're, you're harvesting water and, and growing your food, but also growing your fodder for the purposes of the livestock. Then that becomes a circular system. Uh, at national level, of course, you need a um, massive amount of energy. And still, we can use the circular energy approaches. And it, like in our cities, our cities, there's a lot of waste, a lot of biomass waste, a lot of um, um, you know, carbon waste, uh, whether it is from the slaughterhouse, whether it is just um, you know, from the toilets that we flush. And that system, again, can be harnessed and used for purposes of generating power that can sustain cities. The technology is there. And uh, what tends to be lacking is, is the political goodwill uh, for that. So there are many ways of uh, ensuring that uh, we are living within our means. And the key point I'm trying to make here is we need to think in terms of circular system of economic development. And therefore, what is uh, you know, released as waste is actually retained in the system longer and used for purposes of sustaining the system, either the, through energy use or other means of, of circulation. So that would be uh, my approach uh, in the cities. And of course, beyond that, you've got a lot of sunshine. Uh, we need to find a way of, uh, you know, increasing our use of uh, sun's energy and uh, wind and uh, for the purposes of generating electricity. And in this case, my thinking is that we don't need massive uh, you know, grids that goes all over the country. We can have localized grids. I don't see why you know, small towns, small areas, small villages cannot have energy electricity that supports it that is local. So that way it is distributive and it, we have less uh, impact on, you know, on the environment in the long run. So that's my thinking, Mr. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm mindful of the time and uh, not that you have to run to your uh, next meeting uh, quite soon. And so I will uh, say thank you now. And uh, it was absolutely a pleasure that uh, you could uh, join us this afternoon. Um, and I think I reflect everyone's views uh, when I say that uh, this was uh, an awesome introduction into issues of justice uh, within the climate change regime, um, buttressed by uh, very practical examples about how uh, Global South interests have been mediated uh, or failed to be mediated within the system. Thanks a lot, Nick. Um, Thank you. I Thank look you. forward to speaking to you So, Okay. Okay, and we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so uh, to everyone else, I would like to uh, thank you for uh, joining us for this workshop. Uh, it was uh, uh, a good experience for me, a, a wonderful experience for me. Um, I hope that uh, somehow we can continue conversations about these issues uh, of uh, climate change and climate justice uh, in other uh, fora. Uh, as happens with things like this, I'd like to plug our next event, uh, which is not uh, strictly on climate change, but it's on constitutional rights. And we have the 
Attorney General of the Republic of Malawi, uh, joining us uh, this Wednesday evening. Uh, please look at our various uh, channels, our website, uh, but also social media to find out the details. It will be an interesting talk uh, with uh, uh, the Attorney General who was involved in uh, uh, quite a seminal case uh, quite recently. Um, and with that, I'd like to say, um, have a nice afternoon or wherever you are, if it's morning, have a, uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your, of your morning uh, and we shall see you soon. Okay, I think since the others are leaving slowly, um, maybe we could address the seminar participants now in a bit more informal way. So thank you for attending today. Um, we hope it was informative and helpful for you. Um, I can imagine that it was also overwhelming at the same time. Um, don't feel um, too much pressured, maybe, if this is the correct way to put it. Um, we have recorded all the sessions, so there is the possibility to rewatch it. And it is not necessary that you understood everything. As I said last week already, it was only an introduction. And when you have questions, um, you can raise them now or at any time. Um, we can continue the discussion on e-learning. Um, yeah, and maybe Toko also wants to address some words to you. Yeah, um, it's been a long day already and I think a lot of uh, uh, information has been exchanged. Um, I am sure uh, you'll have questions about um, uh, application of some of these uh, principles in relation to uh, the various topics that you'll be looking at. And um, I think I'll give you an opportunity to just digest some of these uh, principles and how the institutions are arrayed and all of that. And we can continue this uh, conversation uh, in the other fora that we have uh, for uh, for, for the seminar. But for this afternoon, uh, unless you have a pressing question, I think uh, it is uh, uh, okay that we, we leave it, we leave it here. Um, uh, so unless uh, one of you has got a pressing question now, I think uh, we can say our goodbyes. Okay, I take that as a sign of no question. Yeah? Okay, guys. Uh, so I will see you when I see you next, okay? Okay, all right. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.